I'm reading today from Dr. Edward Edinger's The Ion Lectures, Exploring the Self in C.G. Jung's Ion, edited by Deborah A. Wesley, published by Inner City Books. This is part two. Inflation is one of the problems Jung speaks of in Ego's encounter with the self. In paragraph 44, he says, quote, the more numerous and the more significant the unconscious contents which are assimilated to the ego, the closer the approximation of the ego to the self, even though this approximation must be a never-ending process. This inevitably produces an inflation of the ego unless a critical line of demarcation is drawn between it and the unconscious figures. But this act of discrimination yields practical results only if it succeeds in fixing reasonable boundaries to the ego and in granting the figures of the unconscious, the self, anima, animus, and shadow, relative autonomy and reality of a psychic nature. Unquote. Fixing reasonable boundaries to the ego is an important feature of practical analysis. For instance, it is commonplace to hear such remarks as, I made this mistake, I had that reaction, when in fact these events are products of the unconscious. Jung gives an example of this in his Houston interviews. The young interviewer asks him why a patient selects a particular symptom and Jung jumps on him with a vengeance. Quote, he doesn't select, they happen to him. You could ask just as well when you are eaten by a crocodile, how you happen to select that crocodile. He has selected you, unquote. Footnote, Richard Evans, Jung on Elementary Psychology, page 216. The ego does not choose its symptoms. It is a victim of the particular symptom that the unconscious throws up. The symptom is like a crocodile that grips and possesses one. This is most important to realize. This is how we fix reasonable boundaries to the ego. We don't grant to the ego power and responsibility that don't properly belong to it. That would be inflation. Jung's discussion of inflation continues with its perils. Quote, no more than a flight of steps or a smooth floor is needed to precipitate a fatal fall. This condition, inflation, should not be interpreted as one of conscious self-aggrandizement, such as far from being the rule. Unquote. References to paragraph 44 of the original ion. Inflation is far more subtle than that. It is a completely unconscious, unscrutinized presupposition almost universally held that there is no such thing as an autonomous psyche beyond the ego. Anyone who talks in public about the autonomous psyche is suspected of being a little crazy. Although this state of unconscious inflation is practically universal, one generally does not get into trouble with it. It is astonishing that the vast majority of people can live quite happily in a state of inflation. It is a natural condition unless the individuation process is activated. Then one is held to account. Another important point in the same paragraph is that one symptom of inflation is a growing disinclination to take note of the reactions of the environment and pay heed to them. It is good to remember that the unconscious comes to us from the outside as well as the inside, so that the reactions people have to us, the events that happen around us, are all expressions of the unconscious just as much as a dream is. Jung then goes on to speak of two alternative psychic catastrophes, one in which the ego is assimilated by the self and the other where the self is assimilated by the ego. Now, assimilation is a euphemism for being eaten. 
Throughout nature, the basic question is who eats whom? If the self eats the ego, at the worst there is an overt psychosis. If the ego eats the self, which seems like an impossible thing to do since the smaller should not be able to swallow the larger, still Jung does speak of such condition, then the self becomes assimilated in the ego, in which case the world of consciousness must now be leveled down in favor of the reality of the unconscious. Paragraph 47. If the ego devours the self, then we have the rationalistic inflation that is so prominent in which the ego assumes itself to be the totality. In such a case, the antidote must be that the powers of the ego be leveled down in favor of the reality of the unconscious. In the previous situation in which the self assimilates the ego, the contrary is called for. All the conscious virtues, attention, conscientiousness, patience, adaptation, must be mobilized to the maximum degree. Jung continues in paragraph 48, quote, the real moral problems spring from conflicts of duty. Anyone who is sufficiently humble or easygoing can always reach a decision with the help of some outside authority. But one who trusts others as little as himself can never reach a decision at all unless it is brought about in the manner which common law calls an act of God. In all such cases, there is an unconscious authority which puts an end to doubt by creating a full fait accompli. Jung goes on in paragraph 49 to say that such a fait accompli, an action of uncontrollable natural forces, is from a psychological standpoint much better thought of as the will of God than as the result of natural or instinctive forces, because he says, quote, if the inner authority is conceived as the will of God, our self-esteem is benefited because the decision then appears to be an act of obedience and the result a divine intention, unquote. Jung does admit that this point of view can be used as a convenient way of escaping ego responsibility, but this criticism is justified only when one is knowingly hiding one's own egoistic opinion. This idea of the conflict of duty is quite important practically. When one encounters a major conflict of duty, the opportunity arises to discover the reality of the second center of the psyche, to move from stage two to stage three, because in such a conflict, one is obliged to choose between two evils. One would like to have a choice simply between what is good and what is bad, but when there is a real conflict of duty, the choice is between two evils, which means one cannot avoid experiencing the opposites. Whatever choice one makes, it is apparent that goodness and badness are being carried simultaneously. An example of such a decision might be whether to have an abortion. Abortion is a crime against nature and one pays a heavy psychological price for it. On the other hand, it can also be a real crime to bring a child into the world in circumstances that are gravely unsuitable for its well-being. In such a case, the choice is between two evils, and there is no way of avoiding it. Jung makes the point that the unconscious authority puts an end to such a conflict of duty by creating a fait accompli. All our unconscious, unwilled actions, all our so-called mistakes, are such fait accompli. Such mistakes may have two different interpretations. For the young, the appropriate interpretation is that the mistake results from a failure of the will, because the young must have ego consolidation, and the emphasis must be on ego responsibility. If a mistake is made by the young, it is proper that they take responsibility for it. For someone in the second half of life, 
a mistake is properly understood as an act of God. And this is how I think one should understand so-called mistakes in analytic work with patients. They are meaningful acts of God, and in that sense, they are not quite mistakes at all. They are interventions from the unconscious that have a purposefulness still to be discovered. Jung continues in paragraph 59 with an important statement, quote, although wholeness seems at first sight to be nothing but an abstract idea like anima and animus, it is nevertheless empirical insofar as it is anticipated by the psyche in the form of spontaneous or autonomous symbols. Wholeness is thus an objective factor that confronts the subject independently of him. Unquote. As Jung points out here, the factor of wholeness is at the top of the hierarchy of psychic entities. This is something we should have constantly in mind as we work with patient material, because images of wholeness of the self show up in dreams all the time. They can go unrecognized, so it is important to be thoroughly versed in the autonomous images of wholeness, such as quaternities, mandalas, the axiom of Maria, footnote, one becomes two, two becomes three, and out of the third comes the one as the fourth. The interplay of opposites, the union of opposites, all such images are expressions of that objective factor that confronts the subject independently of himself. In paragraph 60, Jung says that individual mandalas are symbols of order and occur in patients principally during times of psychic disorientation or reorientation. Images of order do not show up from the unconscious unless consciousness is in a state of disorder. Every now and then, someone will say, oh, I wish I could have such nice mandala dreams as such and such in that book. That person doesn't know what he or she is asking for. Such dreams come at a heavy price. Finally, I should mention paragraph 65, in which Jung speaks of metaphysical concepts that have lost their root connection with natural experience. Such concepts were once the containers for the collective projection of the self-image. Such concepts were once the containers for the collective projection of the self-image. When that projection is withdrawn from the metaphysical ideas, the individual loses the sense that there is any meaning in them. Jung thought that one of his tasks in his later years was the redemption of metaphysics. He wanted to preserve the meaning that previously had been embedded in theological and metaphysical concepts by uncovering the psychic realities which had formerly been projected into them. This ends the reading of Dr. Edinger's commentary. Okay, I'll have another go at it. Uh, I'm reading today from Dr. Edward Edinger's The Ion Lectures. It does make you wonder about certain person. It does make you wonder about certain personages in our politics these days. Inflation is far more subtle than that. It is a completely unconscious, unscrutinized presupposition, almost universally held. It is a completely unconscious, unscrutinized presupposition almost universally held that there is no such thing as an autonomous psyche beyond the ego. Anyone who talks in public about the autonomous psyche is suspected of being a little crazy. Although this state of unconscious inflation is practically universal, one generally does not get into trouble with it. It is astonishing that the vast majority of people can live quite happily in a state of inflation. It is a natural condition unless the individuation process is activated. 
then one is held to account. 